Terry Sweeney, who's our first speaker this morning, was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1967 after graduating from the University of Western Ontario with a business administration degree at Osgoode Hall Law School in 1965. He is a partner in the firm of Borden Elliott in Toronto. His practice is restricted to taxation matters. Terry is author of a number of articles on tax, customs, and anti-dumping legislation in Canada, and is presently the chairman of the tax section of the Ontario branch of the Canadian Bar Association. Mr. Terry Sweeney. Thanks, Marv. I apologize in advance for the state of my voice, but the uh, Singapore flu stopped off at our house earlier this week. I um, was honored when Jim Kennedy asked me to uh, participate in this 30th anniversary uh, program of the March Special Lectures, but I was just a wee bit chagrined when I realized the magnitude of the topic he assigned to me, which is nicely covered in about 200 pages in most books, and I have to cover it in something uh, less than 45 minutes. So I'm, I've uh, concentrated on the recent in the title of our program and uh, have picked up matters of topical interest, particularly the changes introduced into the law in the, in the last two years. Tax law is evergreen, it seems to me. We're annually confronted with change upon change, usually designed to plug perceived loopholes, those loopholes perceived by Revenue Canada, so that the taxation laws have become the preserve of a relatively few of us who might be better employed in determining how the taxation system got this way and why it couldn't be more truly reformed. In order to deal with this subject in the time allotted, I've had to assume that all of you have a fairly uh, general knowledge of the main principles of taxation on death, and I've assumed that in preparing this paper. <clears throat> we all know, I hope, that there's a deemed disposition immediately before death of all of one's capital property at fair market value, unless it's bequeathed to a spouse or a qualifying spouse trust. A deemed disposition immediately before death of all of one's depreciable capital property of a prescribed class at the halfway point between the undepreciated capital cost of such class and its fair market value at death, unless disposed of to a spouse or a qualifying spouse trust. It follows from this, therefore, that at death the deceased is deemed not to own any depreciated capital property and no capital cost allowance can be claimed on his terminal period return. If you want authority for that, it's Katz Estate, 76 DTC. We're all happy to see the end of Ontario succession duties. My grandfather told me one time that once the government put a tax on, they never took it off. But he's been proven wrong in this field. As we all know, we had the terrific changes to the Estate Tax Act, which lasted about three years, repealed them, and now they've actually repealed the succession duties. So we're grateful for that. The rules on carry forward of allowable capital losses are relaxed at death, and this is fairly uh, consistent. They give us all a break when we die, and they, they loosen up those rules uh, at least once, so that the um, personal representatives of the deceased are able to offset such losses, which may be carried forward for a long time, unrestricted by the usual $2,000 limitation. This rule is easy to state, like a lot of things in uh, in this area, but I wonder just how easy it is to implement in practice. Uh, because unless the deceased kept meticulous records from December 1971, I have a feeling that a lot of these allowable capital losses will be lost, in fact. Section 164 sub 6 can be a useful section, and um, that is a situation where if the personal representative in the course of administering the estate of a deceased realizes a capital or terminal loss within the first taxation year of the estate, he may elect to have such losses treated as the deceased's. Now that's a brief run through of some of the general principles, but in preparing this paper, I was struck by just how many decisions have to be made by the personal representatives of a large estate in administering that estate. For example, all of us must be aware of the myriad number of elections available under the Income Tax Act. And the selection of one or all of these can significantly reduce the income tax burden on an estate and its beneficiaries. In short, it seems to me that if you're going to practice in this area, 
you do so at your peril unless you continually upgrade your knowledge of the subject. And I guess that's why we have such a good turnout uh, yesterday and today. I haven't heard of a negligence case against a solicitor for an estate who failed to advise on the proper use of an election under the Act or failed, for example, to file such an election or tax return in time to the detriment of the estate or its beneficiaries. I predict, however, that such suits are going to be launched because of the complexity in the area and also perhaps because we're graduating so many lawyers annually. Returns and the payment of tax. It's clear that the obligation to file income tax returns of a deceased is placed clearly on his personal representatives. And here again, his lot is not an easy one since in the first year following the taxpayer's death, he may have to file no less than five different tax returns. An income tax return for any years uh, for which the deceased failed to file them, a terminal period return for the uh, period from January 1st to the date of death. If the individual, this is a rather unusual one, but if the individual received income from a testamentary trust and he dies after the end of the taxation year of the trust, but before the end of that calendar year, a separate return of his income from the testamentary trust after the end of the trust taxation year may be filed. That's three. If the taxpayer, and this, this is of interest to us, if the deceased was a partner or sole proprietor and died after the close of the fiscal period but before the end of the calendar year, he too can file a separate return uh, reporting his uh, partnership income. And finally, the famous rights and things return is uh, also available to the personal representatives. With each of these income tax returns that, are, that is filed on behalf of a deceased taxpayer, full personal exemptions without proration for the balance of the year subsequent to the date of death may be taken. For example, and provided that each of these returns has some interest income in it, the $1,000 interest and dividend deduction may be taken in appropriate cases. It's clear then that a good deal of post-mortem tax planning can be done by the personal representatives and considerable care will have to be taken by them to determine whether it's beneficial to file the various returns that are available. Terminal period return. There's nothing particularly magic about this return. It covers the stub period from January 1st of the year of death to the date of death, prepared in the same way as any other uh, taxpayer's return. Periodic amounts are dealt with specifically in subsection 70 sub 1, and which these are amounts which may have been owed to the taxpayer but have not been paid prior to his death. They must be included in a terminal period return. But uh, no special election need be made with respect to them. As we go through this, you'll see that there's only about one or two instances in the paper where the personal representatives don't have a decision to make as to whether or not to file a special election. Periodic amounts include things like interest, rents, royalties, and so on. The rights are things return. There's a lot said about it. I'm not sure. Uh, just how uh, common it is, really. But um, if he had rights or things as defined at his death, the, it may be desirable for the personal representatives to make the appropriate election and file a separate return in respect of these items, or alternatively to transfer them to designated beneficiaries under the provisions of subsection 70 sub 3. Some of you may be familiar with the Tory estate case, which is a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, and uh, that decision is 76 DTC, where the, um, the use of the return is illustrated. The election to file this particular return must be filed with Revenue Canada by the later of one year after his death or within 90 days after the mailing of the notice of assessment for the year of death. If it's decided to transfer rights and things directly to beneficiaries, as was done in the Tory estate case, then the transfer must take place within the time frame available to make an election in respect to such rights or things which I just discussed. Department of National Revenue, in one of its rare liberal moods, has uh, said that if there's any doubt as to whether something's a right or a thing, the benefit of the doubt will be given to the taxpayer. A good deal of discussion has taken place as to what is a right or thing, but the Act has been amended to make it clear that uh, rights or things do not include eligible capital property, land included in the inventory of a business or a resource property. 
And Revenue Canada has recently ruled in Tax Ruling 86, dated July 30, 79, that interest earned but not received on a single premium annuity certificate, I'll have a little bit to say about them later, um, is a right or thing. Interestingly, the, if, you, if you make the election to file a separate return, it's not irrevocable and you can change your mind provided you do so within the time limit available for filing it in the first place. The Income Tax Act calls for the terminal period return to be filed by the personal representatives within six months from the date of death of the deceased, but uh, here again Revenue Canada um, is a little generous and allows personal representatives the option to file on the later of that date or April 30th of the taxation year following the date of death. The only authority for that is the uh, guide which they issue with the particular return. If a spousal trust is created by the will, then the personal representatives have up to 18 months from the date of death to file a return. But it's interesting that Revenue Canada wants their interest because uh, even though you don't have to file that return until that later date, interest does run from the, the later of six months following his, his death or April 30th. You should be careful when you're considering whether or not you should elect to file a separate rights or things return because if you do, um, then general averaging is not available. It is available if you don't. Installment payments. If you have particular types of, of income in a deceased estate, like rights or things, even if he didn't file the appropriate election, recapture of capital cost allowance, and of interest to us particularly, 71 receivables, then a special election's available to uh, pay that tax over a period up to 10 years. If the personal representatives furnish acceptable security, they can pay the income tax over the 10-year period, of course, with interest. And interest, uh, uh, most recently, is on unpaid tax has been increased to 11%. And remember, that's not deductible, so that's not perhaps all that good a deal. Medical expenses, another option available um, in the year of death, not available to uh, normal taxpayers. If the deceased had uh, qualifying medical expenses, i.e. greater than 3% of his, of his income, the normal rule is that he has to deduct these expenses for a 12-month period ending in the taxation year. However, uh, with the deceased, they have the choice to, to pick a 12-month period commencing in the taxation year. This gives flexibility, I think, to personal representatives to deal with medical expenses that may in fact come in after the, the deceased's death. The Act provides a number of reserves. Um, if somebody sells capital property and, and uh, payment is deferred over a period of time, he can claim a reserve against his income for subsequent years pending re actual receipt of those payments on the capital property. But uh, when one dies, generally reserves are eliminated and brought into income immediately, subject to uh, um, what I'm going to tell you in a minute about spouses. For example, a fairly common and simple estate freeze these days is to have the father sell his shares in the company to his son at fair market value. The son would pay a nominal down payment and the balance would be evidenced by a promissory note payable 30 days after demand. That sort of never-never state planning has, has uh, passed muster with Revenue Canada and is being done uh, regularly. And uh, that would be a good example of the type of reserve which would be brought into income when that father, the state freezer, died. Uh, insurance agents or brokers who claim a reserve uh, in respect of unearned commissions on insurance contracts other than life insurance uh, also are able to claim a reserve under Section 32. So, but there is relief provided if, it, if the reserve is transferred to, the, to a, a surviving spouse. If the deceased was a Canadian resident immediately prior to his death and the receivable subject to the reserve was transferred to a spouse or spouse trust, then effectively the reserve can continue to be claimed by the spouse and, will not, and the income will not be brought into, the, into that of the deceased. Again, a special joint election has to be made by the spouse or spouse trust and the personal representative in order to get this benefit. I haven't added up. You know, when I did this paper, I was going to add up just the number of uh, 
collections that are available. And maybe when I, when I do the paper in, uh, in final form for publication, there'll be a little appendix showing you there must be 150 elections that could be made in one of these estates. But I ran out of time on adding them up. So I think it's important uh, insofar as uh, uh, the reserve particularity is concerned and the, uh, the administration of the, state, of the estate generally that ample discretion is given to the personal representatives in the will to allocate, for example, receivables to spouses or spouse trusts to enable them to uh, take advantage of the breaks that are available in the Act. Charitable do donations, <coughs> remember it's the same rule as uh, with a, uh, a living taxpayer, that is, uh, you can't make charitable donations in excess of 20% of one's income unless it's made to a uh, Her Majesty, in which case there's no limit. May, there is some interesting tax planning there, too, involving the Ontario Heritage Foundation, but uh, that's for another topic, uh, another day. You uh, may occasionally have a client who wishes to bequeath by his will some tangible property to a charity or to the Crown if it can be reasonably regarded as suitable for use by the donee directly in the course of carrying on its charitable public service or other similar activities, an option is available to the personal representatives to elect any amount between the fair market value of the property and its adjusted cost base at the time of debt as the amount to be included in the terminal period return. This produces the figure for proceeds of disposition for the uh, taxpayer, deceased taxpayer, and thus is uh, part of the computation of any capital gain or recapture of depreciable property uh, on his death. The uh, personal representatives will have to examine this one carefully too to determine the tax position of the deceased and determine the optimum elected value on such tangible property. Obviously they'll be influenced in making their decision by the amount of, if any, um, allowable capital losses, for example, which had been carried forward by the um, deceased. Now, life isn't complicated enough, so the federal government's enacted the Cultural Property Export and Import Act. And uh, I don't suppose this is a terribly uh, common thing, but if your, if your client bequeathed property which qualifies under that statute, or you come across a client who wants to bequeath property which could qualify under that statute, the deduction uh, is also available, not limited by the 20% figure. This must also be claimed on the terminal period return, and a deduction for such capital property donated is allowed to the extent that the amount was not otherwise deducted as a charitable donation. Interestingly, it appears that the uh, disposition of cultural property can result in a capital loss, but not in a capital gain. Um, I concluded that about Wednesday night but I think that's what the uh, sections provide. And when I was preparing this paper, I thought about Mr. President Nixon and uh, speculate on the possibilities in this field uh, available to uh, one of our better known politicians to uh, donate his personal files to a government or a recognized institution and secure a deduction from his current income tax or make the bequest by his will in an effort to reduce the incidence of tax on his death. There doesn't appear to be anything to prevent such uh, innovative tax planning, provided, of course, that appropriate valuations can be obtained. Whether or not they're likely to do it is uh, another question. The Registered Retirement Savings Plan. This has got to be the most, the personal, uh, the principal residence and the RRSP have got to be the two largest items in most people's uh, tax returns as, as the years go by. And I'm sure you've heard from others, and you're going to hear from Wolf Goodman later on, just how, how desirable it is to use the RRSP. I think all of us are convinced of it, providing we can uh, meet the interest payments on the bank loans we make on February 27th to put the money in, we'll be all right. But anyway, when an annuitant dies, uh, having an RRSP, he's deemed to have received immediately before his death an amount as a benefit under the RRSP equal to the amount by which the fair market value of all the property of the plan at the time of his death exceeds the portion that as a consequence of his death becomes receivable by his spouse or if he has no spouse surviving by a qualifying child or grandchild. This is new, this particular part here. Um, 
and it's tied in with the definition of a refund of premiums in the statute. And basically, the refund of premiums is the amount paid to a spouse, or if he has no spouse, to a qualifying child or grandchild who was dependent, um, sorry, if he, if he was dependent on, if the child or grandchild was dependent by physical or mental disability on the deceased, there's no limit. If not, the amount available to be deducted is uh, the amount which does not exceed $5,000 times the difference between the age of the child and 26 years. This has a familiar ring to me because there is a similar provision in the Ontario Succession Duty Act, as I recall. Perhaps they lifted it from that statute. The um, fairly stringent requirements to qualify, the child uh, must not have been claimed by, his, uh, by a dependent by any other person other than the annuitant and the computation of his taxable income. And uh, the income of the dependent must not have exceeded $5,000. So like so many things, it takes a page and a half to deal with. And I really wonder how many of us are actually ever going to have recourse to it. But there it is. If the, uh, I think all of us recognize the importance of naming a spouse by contract with the trust, uh, with the trust company as the beneficiary. Um, and if instead of that the estate is named, then there is another election available to make sure that the refund of premiums which would otherwise go to the estate goes to the spouse. But uh, if you fail to make the election, you won't get the break. Um, we had a problem in the office not too long ago, which I thought I'd share with you and uh, you might find interesting involving the IRSP and, and its, uh, its worth. We were acting for a wealthy woman who was about to be divorced by her husband. Uh, both spouses were over 60 years of age, and the husband, among other things, was going to have to pay about $30,000 per annum on account of alimony. He had a very large amount in his IRSP, incredibly large, actually. And um, we were interested in somehow securing his obligation under the IRSP. He wanted to, uh, he was quite content to pay the $30,000 uh, per annum and quite content to satisfy us that, that we'd get it if anything ever happened to him. But he wanted to leave the monies in the IRSP as long as possible, obviously, in order to produce the maximum amount of income sheltered from, ta from tax. He proposed to Covenant to provide $250,000, which we calculated as the actuarial, not we, but an expert calculated as the actuarial equivalent to produce $30,000 a year. He uh, covenant to provide that to uh, purchase a joint life annuity for our client and himself at age 71. We all recognized that this could be done, but the plan foundered when we realized that if he died, having divorced his spouse, our client, which is of course what he intended to do, the annuity payment would then pass to someone who was not his spouse. The annuity payments would then be commuted and the value of the payments would be included in his income for the year of death, but not included in the income of our client. That's good so far, but not from his point of view. Um, our client would be jointly and severally liable for the income tax, but after all, she'd have the money. Um, so we, we cast around for another way to do this. and. Uh, tentatively came up with the following plan. There aren't the same uh, detailed rules with registered pension plans, uh, so that an alternative has, is being developed uh, under which the husband would roll out the required amount of money from his RRSP and into a registered pension plan established by his corporation. This can be done on a tax deferred basis. The husband would then elect early retirement and the joint life annuity is bought for him and his spouse. In these circumstances, when the husband dies, having divorced his wife, the annuity payments aren't taxed in the deceased's estate. Different variations on this theme can be developed. If the husband was 62 and in good health and we agreed, the trustee of the registered pension plan could buy the joint life annuity now, but defer receipt of the annuity until, say, the husband reached 65. The advantage of this to the husband is that less money would have to be rolled out of his RRSP now and into the registered pension plan to fund the annuity. I think the message of that is that uh, uh, we have, I don't, some of my friends out there may have had more experience with this than I have, but it's interesting if you have time to sit down and play with these sections, you can develop some very interesting and intriguing uh, tax planning devices because uh, the more complicated Revenue Canada makes the rules, the more likelihood there is that they'll leave some gaps in them. <laughs>
The registered home ownership savings plan, I guess that's still uh, not nearly as important as the RRSP. <clears throat> but anyway, the fair market value of the assets in an RHOSP immediately before the beneficiary's death are included in the income of the deceased in the year of death unless his spouse receives a single payment from the RHOSP within 15 months of the death of the beneficiary. The spouse here is entitled to use the proceeds to buy a home or an income averaging annuity contract as alternatives to paying income tax on the payment. Income averaging annuity contracts are, are very popular with me and uh, those clients of ours that are fortunate enough to have uh, large capital gains. Um, all of you should be aware of their availability and uh, where you can get them as I think they're a highly desirable tax saving device. The registered retirement income fund is a, another layer of rules that's been put on us to cope with and as a result of the Consumers Association of Canada agitating against the life insurance companies and the treatment of RRSPs. The Act used to stipulate that the proceeds of an RRSP had to be converted at age 71 into a life annuity, which are all, it's only sold by life insurance companies, or else it had to be deregistered and subjected to full income tax. And as I say, the Consumers Association were most unhappy about this and got changes in the legislation made. So that as of June 30th, 1978, the taxpayers allowed two alternatives to the life annuity on the maturity of his RRSP. And note that none of these can be taken until he's 60. The proceeds may be invested in a fixed term annuity, which provides benefits until the individual reaches 90, or they may be transferred to a RIF. That's the Registered Retirement Income Fund I'm talking about here. A RIF is really structured, managed, and taxed very much as an RRSP and is offered by those institutions eligible to offer term certain annuities. A RIF can be self-administered, and each year an increasing fraction of the RIF must be withdrawn so that the fund will be exhausted by the time the taxpayer or his spouse reaches 90. It's quite a tax deferral inherent in that particular way, as well as the uh, benefits of being able to continue to control your own destiny, which may be good or, or bad. A recent amendment, a uh, technical amendment to the Act, allows an elderly person who has a RRF, a RIF, to retire to Florida without suffering the deemed disposition under Section 48, the departure tax, when one leaves Canada. Small business and family farms. Small businessmen and uh, farmers have always enjoyed special tax breaks, particularly under the old Succession Duty Act. I guess it's because there are more of them than there are of us. But anyway, uh, each taxpayer who owns stock in a small business corporation is defined, which is fairly easy to get in the definition, has a cumulative small business gains account. This simply means that the first $200,000 of capital gain or $100,000 of taxable capital gain realized on a disposition of shares in such a corporation, either on death or in her vivos, uh, if this disposition is made to a child or grandchild, is free of income tax. Actually, it goes further than grandchild to great-grandchild, but never mind. Obviously, there are conditions that must be fulfilled. The child must be resident in Canada immediately before the death of the taxpayer, but apparently need not be a resident of Canada afterwards. The capital stock must be indefeasibly vested in such child within 15 months of the taxpayer's death. In these circumstances, the deceased taxpayer will be deemed to have disposed of such capital stock at its fair market value, less the balance in his cumulative small business gains account, or such lesser amount as is specified by the taxpayer's legal representative. And again, the reason why the personal representatives might wish to elect a smaller amount is because of allowable capital losses that the taxpayer has been carrying forward since 1971. There isn't much point in using up the uh, the cumulative small business gains account when you don't really need to because one of the results of, of this deferral is that while the, there's no income tax paid on the first $100,000 of taxable capital gain, the child inherits the shares at the lower adjusted cost base. So his exposure on a future disposition is increased. Shares in a qualifying small business corporation can be first left for the use of a spouse through the use of a qualifying spouse trust. The rollover to the child on the death of the spouse is preserved in the same way and subject to the same restrictions 
as when the shares are left directly to a child on his parents' death. The, the deal, the double whammy rollover has been closed so that those who thought you could get a $400,000 capital gain shielded by putting it through your spouse, um, that has now been closed off. We were recently consulted by a Norwegian individual held a minority interest in a Canadian-controlled private corporation. He wanted to transfer his interest to his three sons, one of whom was a landed immigrant and resident of Canada. And certainly insofar as the one son was concerned, we were able to tell him that such a transfer, because he was below the limit, would have no adverse Canadian income tax consequences. All the conditions of the section were satisfied in particular it's important to note that the transferor need not be a resident of Canada in this particular case. This section may be of some assistance if you are acting as I did on one occasion for a resident of the United States who dies owning a minority interest in a Canadian private corporation. By definition it must be a minority interest, doesn't it, because it otherwise wouldn't qualify as a Canadian controlled private corporation. Article 8 of the Canada U.S. Tax Convention exempts residents of the United States from Canadian income tax on the sale or exchange of capital property, provided the U.S. resident has no permanent establishment in Canada. Regrettably, Revenue Canada is, takes a restricted view of Article 8 and holds that a deemed disposition on death is not a sale or exchange of capital assets and will tax any capital gain deemed to be realized on taxable Canadian property on the death of the U.S. resident, in my case. This may be a bit academic because in the case I had, the, the U.S. Um, representatives were able to get a credit for the Canadian income tax that was paid. There's a recent case, uh, not directly on point, Davis, ADDTC, where the Federal Court of Appeal didn't really deal specifically with the question, but seems to agree that a deemed disposition under Section 48, uh, that departure tax, does not, is not protected by Article 8. Mind you, the case is a little difficult to come to that conclusion, but that it seems to be authority for the courts uh, for the view taken by Revenue Canada. And this offends me, really, that Revenue Canada takes this position because uh, international tax treaties are supposed to be interpreted liberally in the interest of the comity of nations. And if I could just digress for a minute, uh, this is one little example, but there are others uh, where Revenue Canada and their haste to collect taxes from Canadians um, technically abrogate international treaties. Um, a recent case uh, involving um, a company that went offshore uh, to the Netherlands in 1971, uh, was decided not too long ago, late 1979, federal court held that a provision dealing with the deemed residents of uh, companies under the Income Tax Act was in direct violation of an international treaty. But uh, it's taken, what, seven years to get this decision? And how many other taxpayers in the meantime uh, have been uh, prejudiced? Um, there are other uh, examples too, like 212.1 of the Income Tax Act, where Revenue Canada deems a capital gain to be a dividend it seems to me that if anybody attacks that particular provision, uh, arguing the Canada-U.S. tax treaty, for example, that it too will be struck down. But uh, we're waiting to be retained on that one, I guess. The Family Farm and Family Farm Corporation, uh, the rollover here uh, of these assets is more generous than that provided to shares in a small business corporation. But the flexibility available to personal representatives is more restricted. For example, there's no $200,000 cap on the rollover. A million dollar farm could be transferred to the deceased child on death provided certain conditions are met. The rollover is automatic and no election need be filed. So the personal representatives don't have that option they have with the shares of a small business corporation to elect a transfer value which will eat up some capital losses of the deceased. So if a farmer dies, running an unincorporated farm and bequeaths the farm to a child who was resident in Canada immediately before the death of the taxpayer and the property can be said to vest indefeasibly in such child within 15 months or such longer periods reasonable in the circumstances. The land will go at ACB 
and depreciable property of a prescribed class at its undepreciated capital cost. The child, qualifying child, is deemed to acquire such assets for an amount equal to such proceeds of disposition, classic rollover treatment. Note further that there's no requirement that the child resides in Canada after his father's death, so that once he inherits the farm, he could lease it to tenants and retire to a warmer, warmer clime. So too with shares in the family farm corporation or partnership. The test for each is that all or substantially all of the property of the corporation or partnership must be used by the deceased, his spouse, or any child in carrying out a farming business in Canada. The child must meet the same test, but if he does, the shares will be deemed to be transferred at an ACB and no tax collected. Interestingly, a hobby farmer who's limited to deducting no more than $5,000 per annum of farming losses in the computation of his income may still qualify on death for this, for this rollover. Uh, this takes a careful reading of the relevant sections in the case of the Supreme Court of Canada in Moldawan, M-O-L-D-O-W-A-N, 77 DTC, 5213. Now, I guess all of us are glad that, that some taxpayers get away with, without paying any, any tax, but from a policy point of view, these types of special concessions are discriminatory against the rest of us who necessarily have to shoulder a heavier burden. It appears clear also that a transfer of a particular farm could move from generation to generation and never bear any income tax. And personally, I view this as this large a concession is intolerable to those of us who are unable to pass on any of our capital property to our children without attracting the tax acts. And uh, in discussing this with one of my friends in the office yesterday, the, the argument was put forward, well, yes, but I mean, these farms are increasing so much in value that the people would have to sell them in order to pay the tax. It seems to me that kind of argument is, is contradictory because if they're increasing all that, uh, all that much, that's all the more tax the rest of us are going to have to pay. Buy-sell agreements. Um, everyone knows, I hope by now, that in any uh, private corporation, you should have a buy-sell agreement. And if there's a, uh, an arm's length situation, there isn't likely to be any problem. But uh, with non-arm's length buy-sell agreements, there is potential for a good deal of problem. And this is because the uh, Department of National Revenue takes the position that fair market value for the purposes of the Act must be determined without reference to the buy-sell agreement. This views uh, probably wrong in light of the decided jurisprudence but regrettably, uh, in my experience, the valuation division of the Department of National Revenue has become somewhat adversarial and in some circumstances engages in fiscal blackmail. I've had experiences where the valuation section will select a fair market value just a little higher, a little lower than is fair and challenge the taxpayer to appeal to the courts knowing full well that the costs of doing so are unwarranted. A compromise acceptable to Revenue Canada but not to the client is thus often wrung out of him. Um, we were recently consulted on a problem which I think illustrates the problem. A son retained us who had, without independent legal advice, ex executed various agreements with his father, calling for a buy-sell during life and on death. The documentation was a mess and presented numerous problems, not the least of which was that the funding for the buyout was to be provided from insurance, which hadn't been purchased yet, nor could it practicably be obtained because the premiums payable by the son for insurance on the life of the father would be prohibitive. The main problem highlighted by the documentation and the message I'm trying to get across here was that there was a provision in the agreement that the shares were to be sold at adjusted net worth. The problem was compounded by the language in the documentation which indicated that if Revenue Canada raised an assessment against the value of the shares struck under the agreement, then the purchaser, who because of their relative ages would be our client, would have to pay immediately the increased income taxes payable as a result of an assessment on a fair market value basis. Now this was a particularly onerous provision because the amount of such increased taxes could be significant in my view. And whereas under the balance of the agreement the shares could be purchased over a 10 year period with interest at 10%, the money to pay the increased taxes had to be forthcoming immediately. Uh, the effect of the documentation, in our view, was to invite Revenue Canada to make an assessment and engage in the type of uh, jockeying and fiscal blackmail that I just discussed above. We recommended to our client that he renegotiate the agreements with his father, but so far uh, that's proved fruitless. 
Now, I see Wolf Goodman is sitting over here, and uh, I have some more things to say, but uh, I'll defer to him because my time is up. Thank you. Thank you.